Alrighty, so uh, it's noon, so we'll get started here. I'm just going to share my screen and do a bit of an introduction before we get to the reason we're all really here for the speakers. Maybe I'm going to share my screen. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So my name is Johanna Murray. I'm the extension coordinator here at uh, PCBFA. Um, okay. Thanks for tuning into our first organic webinar. Um, before we get started, a little bit about PCBFA. If I can get the slide to advance. Oh, there we go. Uh, we're a producer run group um, in the Nor in Northern Alberta in the Peace region. We do non-biased applied research and uh, event along with events and webinars to <laughs> provide high quality information to our membership and local farmers. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, we have our website, peacecountrybeef.ca, as well as you can reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, via email, or you can call either of our offices. We are going to record this webinar and we will be sharing the link with anybody who's registered. So uh, if you miss something or if you want to review that in the information given, we will be sending that link out here in the next week or so. And the same for each of the following webinars. So if you find there's one that you just can't make it to, we will be able to send that information out to you. A uh, bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, there is a poll up you can uh, have a look at just so we know kind of who we're talking to so we can tailor our information a little bit. Uh, there's going to be an evaluation at the end of the webinar. If you don't mind to fill that out for us, uh, that'd be great so we know what to improve next time. Uh, we'll be taking questions in between each speaker. So, uh, and then at the end, we will open it up for a bit of a discussion as well if that's something people are interested in. Uh, there's a Q&A box, which some of you have already been making use of. And as well, you can uh, hit the raise hand button, which I have a picture of here. There's the raise hand button there, which you can use to uh, let somebody know that you'd like to ask a question through a mic and I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly that way. I believe we will be doing that just at at the end of the webinar, not uh, periodically, but we will be looking at the at the text questions at the end of each presentation. Uh, is there anything else? I don't think so. Today, so today we're going to hear from three uh, organic certifiers. Um, there are other certifying bodies, obviously, but these are the three who are working with us for this uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about the steps to certification, transitioning from conventional to organic production, and the record keeping process. So the first person we're going to speak, who's going to speak, is uh, Marge from OCIA. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let her carry on. Am I sharing my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, good. Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome. Uh, this is my first webinar doing this, so I'm hoping that uh, I'm not the only one that's that's um, having their first webinar. Um, uh, I look forward to presenting information to you on transitioning to organic. I work for OCIA International. We're one of the founders of organic certification. We have six offices worldwide. Um, we're a member owned organization that is run by an international board. So we've been certifying in Canada for over 32 years. Oh, nothing's moving to my next slide. There we go. So, so what is organic? I thought I'd talk a little, open up with, with what organic is, just in case not everyone is familiar with it. So basically, 
it's a, it's a type of agriculture with a set of principles that put nature first. These principles are enshrined in industry developed standards approved by consumers and verified annually by accredited third party certification bodies. Um, so as defined in the Canadian organic standards, general principles and management standards, organic production is a holistic system designed to optimize the productivity and fitness of diverse communities within the agro ecosystem, including soil organisms, plants, livestock and people. The principal goal of organic production is to develop operations that are sustainable and harmonious with the environment. So when you see the Canadian organic logo that I have up on the right hand corner of my screen there on a food or beverage item, you should feel comfortable knowing that the food was grown and processed in ways that meet our rigorous Canadian organic standards, which are based on the principles of organic agriculture. So these principles include the principle of health, which is organic agriculture should sustain and enhance the health of soil, plants, animals, humans, and the planet as one and indivisible. Principle of ecology, organic agriculture should be based on living or ecological systems and cycles. Work with them, emulate them, and help sustain them. The principle of fairness. Organic agriculture should build on relationships that ensure fairness with regard to the common environment and life opportunities. And principle of care. Organic agriculture should be managed in a precautionary and responsible manner to protect the health and well-being of current and future generations and the environment. So why go organic? Since 2006, the organic market has tripled and is increasing dramatically every single year since then. As of 2017, the Canadian Organic Trade Association has, has um, listed the organic sales in Canada at $5.4 billion. And probably based on the what our consumers are wanting, right? Consumers want a healthier, and sustainable life cycle. So as an organic farmer, you'll rely on energy efficient and cost effective fertilizers and pesticides, such as manures and legumes. Low cost inputs plus premium style sales provide a higher profit for your lifestyle. So what, are organic, what do organic farmers do? So they aim to grow crops and raise livestock in ways that are sustainable and harmonious with the environment. They provide habitat for soil health by adding organic matter and rotating crops. Organic farmers can protect soil life by avoiding excessive tillage and compaction and the use of fertilizers and pesticides that harm other soil organisms. They feed the soil by adding organic matter and growing legumes such as alfalfa and clover which fix nitrogen from the air and make it available to growing crops. Rotate crops. Organic farmers design crop rotations to prevent the buildup of pests, disrupt weed life cycles, keep the soil covered, and use nutrients efficiently. Protect biodiversity by leaving wild areas, rotating crops, and avoiding persistent pesticides. Compared to farms that don't integrate organic practices on average, organic farms have greater biodiversity of birds, insects, and pollinators. So organic certification is a stringent process that requires producers and processors to adhere to a strict set of standards. They go above and beyond all of the applicable food safety laws. They include um, the use of your land has to be free of synthetic chemicals and fertilizers for at least three years. But if you can prove that no prohibited materials have been applied to your land for the minimum of three years, you can be certified in as little as 15 months. Detailed record keeping and regular audits, which means full food traceability. Everything that goes into an organic product must be documented and traceable. Routine on-site inspections. 
Um, minimum once a year, but usually only once a year. Every now and then they have to have a, they have to do an um, uh, unannounced inspection of 10% uh, of their membership. So every now and then you could end up with two inspections, but it doesn't happen very often. And it allows the use of organic labeling. So I kind of put a few steps together for you. First step is most important, get informed. Talk with other organic producers that live around you or in your area. Attend a workshop or a farm tour. Um, attend an organic farming trade show in Canada. There's lots of them now. Get familiar with the standards and regulations. I put the website up there where you can just click on English and then click on organic products. It will take you right to the regulations. And of course, check out other organic transitioning manuals and books that provide tons of information. I know Canadian Organic Growers has a really great set of uh, manuals and books for record keeping, transitioning, uh, cattle, vegetables. They have a really good selection. Who monitors organic standards? Um, so in Canada, the organic standards are called the Canadian Organic Regime. CFIA oversees these regulations. They manage the prohibited substances list and the Safe Foods for Canadians Act. The Canadian Organic Standards Boards makes recommendations about materials and practices used in organic production. Then there's us, certifying agencies, and the inspectors. So understand, step two, understand the requirements during transition. So prohibited substances and those not approved cannot be used on any transitional crops. New organic operations must complete a conversion year under four where they must apply with a certifying agency 15 months before they can have their first crop certified if no substances have been applied for at least three years. They must account for all the land though, even your conventional land. And the standards require producers transition all land eventually. I don't think they have a deadline on there, but I'm sure one of these days they'll find one. You may transition your land though in stages. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, the only thing is be cautious of parallel production. You can't grow the same crops in your conventional or transitional fields and organic fields at the same time. Inputs to the soil or inoculants for the seed must be approved by your certifier before you purchase and apply them. You have the potential to improve your farm soil health, protect the environment, and support your family through higher profitability. Research your certifiers. There's lots of us out there. Find a certifier that holds a very high integrity for the organic industry, one that can provide support and assistance with paperwork through regional associations or however their, their organization is set up. Find a certifier that has your interests at heart, that can help with marketing, that can provide transaction certificates for your, for your audit trail. And find a certi certifier that puts back into the organic industry. Obviously then, they are certainly holding a high integrity for organics. So understand the certification process. Start by getting a hold of a certification agency, Submit your application and an organic system plan. Have an inspection. Respond to agency, sorry, respond to agency questions and then receive a decision. Jaime's going to talk about this next. Apply for certification. There are three ways you can apply for certification through OCIA, but do check with the certifier that you choose how you can actually apply. With us, you have three choices. You can submit a hard copy of the application and forms by mail. You can submit an electronic copy by email. Or we also have our online option now where you can enter it all online with the username and password and it goes directly into our database to start processing it right away. But just a big reminder, always keep a copy of your paperwork no matter which way you apply for certification. Your inspector is definitely going to want to see it. So organic crops, what can you grow during your conversion year? 
So think about a three to four year rotational plan for your farm. If the fields are already in hay or alfalfa, this is a good conversion year crop. If you don't have it in hay or alfalfa, start thinking about what you are going to plant in the next three to four years, and then start planting your seed. If you're not able to find organic seed, you can complete a seed search and then purchase untreated non-GMO seed from, from a, a supplier. But see, some seeds can be treated, but it has to be an approved inoculant. A non-GMO affidavit should be signed or a letter stating the same from the seed supplier. Buffer zones. Distinct defined boundaries and buffer zones must be in place to prevent the unintended application of a prohibited sub substance. It has to be a minimum of eight meters. Determination of the buffer adequacy is left to the producer, inspector, the certifier, and it's done on a case by case basis. Really depends on who your neighbors are. You can harvest from your buffer zone if you so choose, but you cannot sell it as organic. It would have to go on the conventional market. And buffer zones must be shown on your farm map so that the inspector knows where they're at and your certifier as well. Keeping records, Cody's gonna talk about this in a lot more depth in a few minutes here. Um, a field history form should include your crop history for the past 36 months and correspond to the areas on your farm map. It must stipulate what was grown in each field and if any inputs were applied, the rate of application and the date it was applied. If you haven't owned that land or been the manager of that land for at least three years, you'll need a prior land use affidavit completed by the former landowner or renter, whoever had it before you. Clean down records should be maintained when equipment or transportation is used for both, both organic and conventional or transitional crops and buffer zones if you're harvesting. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, OCIA. We also have um, uh, another division called Research and Education. And their mission is to support organic research, facilitate connections between farmers researchers, consumers, and decision makers, and educate producers and communities regarding organic farming and foods. And we give away micro grants, $500 to $3,000. We give away scholarships up to $1,000 awarded to students who wanna do organic research. And then this information is shared amongst the membership. They also have Farmer of the Year awards. But I, I just wanted to let you know that we have our microgrants available right now, and this is for any producers that wanted to do any on-farm organic research on their organic land. Uh, they can apply for these microgrants, and we give usually six, seven, eight of them away every year. Um, the deadline actually is coming up right away on March 31st, but you can just email me at canada at ocia.org and uh, I can get you the application for it. But I know we won't be meeting until the middle of February. So, so you probably have that much time to get your application in. Um, one of the scholarships we actually just gave just the other day to a student at the University of Manitoba to do some research. So I'm looking forward to hearing back from them as to what they've done. So I look forward to any of your questions if you, uh, would like more information this is where you can reach me at and uh, thank you very much for your time thanks marge so if you anybody has any questions for marge uh drop them into the q a box uh i see we don't have any right now so i think we will uh move on to jaime and let him go ahead um marge will be on the call until the end of the webinar. So if you think of anything you want to quiz her about, uh, she will be around to answer your questions throughout the rest of the afternoon. Well, not the rest of the afternoon, but the rest of the webinar.
Okay. Uh, thanks, March. Hello, everyone. I'm Jaime Aguilar. I'm an inspector for EcoCert Canada. And what I'm going to show you today is a small video that EcoCert put together um, just to illustrate the, um, the inspection um, ap application process. So if you could just let me know if you are seeing my screen. Yep, that looks good. Okay, so I'll just click here in the video. And uh, is it going now? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Oh, we don't have any volume though. Still no volume. No volume? No volume. Hmm. Oh, this is strange. Everybody's having the same problem? Yeah, if anybody can hear the audio, if it's just me, just let, drop that in the Q&A or in the chat. I'm not even hearing it either, Jaime. It's Mark. Hmm. Well. It may be something related to the connection because here Fred said that he got some volume. Okay, I hear from somebody else that they're not hearing anything, so. You're not hearing anything, okay. Might need to turn it up a little bit maybe, I don't know. Okay, let's try it. Technology. certification can be granted. Is it working better now? For livestock, yes. conversion time depends on the type of animal. The delay to achieve certification can therefore vary from a few months to a year. Each production type has its own standards, and the applicant must comply to these standards in order to obtain organic certification. To learn more, refer to the learning module specific to your activities. It's best to register as early as possible. Organic standard requires that crops and maple syrup producers register at least 15 months before their first organic sales. Make sure to contact EcoCert Canada as soon as you start your transition to organic farming. The 15 month pre-certification time will begin on the day you send in your initial application or certification. For example, a registration form received on May 1st, 2019 means certification of your crops will be possible in August, 2020. What happens once I register? The documents you provide will be reviewed and EcoCert Canada will inform you if anything is missing, if changes are necessary, or to let you know that the file is complete and is passed on to the on-site evaluation team. The on-site evaluation allows EcoCert Canada to verify that your activities meet the criteria of the organic standard. The evaluator will make an appointment sometime during the production season. The visit can be early or late in the season, depending on what needs to be observed. There will be a visit every year. Note that two separate visits with a 12 month interval between them are necessary in the following cases. Field crops, greenhouse crops grown in direct soil, 
and maple and birch products. If you grow your livestock feed, including pasture, two visits are also required. Once the on-site evaluation is complete, the certification officers will analyze the results and they will make a decision. The decision can be positive, meaning everything is compliant and the certificate is issued. Negative, some practices are not compliant to the standard and thus certification is not possible. Or pending, in which case you must demonstrate that you have corrected any non-compliances. When non-compliances are identified, a 30-day period is granted for you to present an action plan, which will allow the situation to be corrected within 90 days following the decision. The certificate is only issued once everything is compliant. For example, the evaluation report mentions an incomplete recording system. Your decision letter will indicate that a corrective action plan is required. Upon receipt of the missing information and an updated and improved record, we will consider the situation managed. The certification officer will then issue the certificate. During the next visit, the evaluator will make sure that you keep using the new record. As a second example, the evaluation report mentions that a piece of equipment represents a risk to the integrity of the organic production. The decision letter will then ask for an action plan. Let's say your action plan is to install a new piece of equipment in the coming month which would be compliant to the standard. Once we receive the purchase and installation invoices for the new equipment, we will consider the situation to be managed and can issue the certificate. During the next visit, the evaluator will have a look at the equipment to confirm that it is now fully compliant. The request for certification must be made every year. As a result, EcoSearch Canada will send the renewal documentation to update your file. So that's the, the video here. Just a little bit more on the steps. EcoCert Canada must perform numerous activities before an organic certificate can be issued. The customer service team, certification officer. So that's repeating again. So I'll skip that and uh, take any questions for, from the attendees if there is some. Don't see any questions at the moment. Okay. Um, if you're happy to stay on till the end, uh, we'll open it up then as well. Sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jaime. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Cody do his presentation. And so I will just get that ready and looks like that's set. Hello. Um, first, I'll uh, go a little bit about or into who is a uh, quick uh, five minute overview. Um, my name's Cody Sander. I've been with ProCert for, I guess, this is year 11 um, as the producer certification coordinator. So, spent lots of time up in the Peace region, up the Mackenzie County area, doing uh, inspections over the past 11 years here. Uh, graduated from Olds College. So, uh, live in Saskatoon here now. Um, so, ProCert is one of North America's foremost certifiers of organic products. I believe we're number uh, four or five on uh, the North America list for, for amount of clients. Um, 
ProCert has been pro providing organic certification since 1990. So that brings us to our 30th year of uh, organic certification. Um, oh, didn't update that one. Uh, ProCert is a Saskatchewan family owned uh, company. Head office is out of Saskatoon. Uh, we do have another office out in Cambrai, Ontario to uh, service Eastern Canada. Um, we have about uh, roughly around 30 contract inspectors located across Canada and the U.S. Uh, it's a, a big advantage for us to be able to reduce our travel cost. Looks like you don't have your uh, screen shared there, Cody. Oh, it's not didn't pull up there. Try not it again. Yet. Oh, there we go. Um, so on to the organic certification. We are accredited to provide certification to the Canada Organic Regime and to the USDA National Organic Program. Uh, other programs that we do offer through uh, through ProServe, we do have a gluten-free certification program that was launched in 2015. That's for processing clients and for producers to to verify uh, the whole supply chain is uh, gluten-free, just like the organic system. Um, another program is the grass-fed certification program, which was launched in fall 2017, and it's uh, we've been approved to do um, provide certification for the dairy farmers of Canada, which should be launched here this fall, uh, their grass fed certification program, other programs, uh, input approval program. And we do have a regenerative organic uh, certified program. Um, I believe there's two certifiers in, in Canada that uh, will be able to offer that this year. So this is a organic plus program. It's one that you must be organic to be able to, uh, apply to this one. So it's organic certification plus the regenerative portion. And on our fee structure, it's based on size and complexity of your operation. Um, it's, uh, we go by base fee and how many acres you have. Uh, the travel fee is set for $185 for all files across Western uh, Canada here this year. So um, before we come out there, you can uh, figure out exactly what your uh, certification costs will be. Um, there will be no additional um, cost efforts for inspections or inspector costs. So uh, important question to ask when you're looking at other um, certification bodies. Five steps to certification, Jaime went through that. So I'll skip that and I'll get to our record keeping portion. Second here to get it opened up. All right, we can see that. Looks good. Okay. So overview here, why do we need, uh, gonna go over why do we need uh, records, the organic system plan application, what is it? Uh, inspection preparation and for audit trail, which includes field bin, uh, transportation and marketing record. So section four of the organic, um, section four of the standards here. Uh, this is why we need organic uh, records. So 4.1, the operator shall prepare an organic plan outlining the details of transition, production, preparation, and management practices. 4.2, the organic plan shall be updated annually to address changes to the plan or management system. Problems encountered in executing the plan and measures taken to overcome such problems. Uh, 4.3, the organic systems plan shall include a description of the internal record keeping system with documents sufficient to traceability requirements as specified in 4.42 and record keeping requirements. Um, I won't read through that one there. 
um, just, you know, no to be familiar of the section 4.4 for the record keeping set section in the can or in the um, Canadian standards. Um, this one, just read the heading of record shall make it uh, possible to trace um, the rigid nature and quantity of organic products that have been delivered to the production unit or operation, the nature, quantity, and consignees of products that have left the production unit. So, um, you know, basically we need to have full traceability from field to uh, to sale of the product. Uh, skip those. Uh, and step nine, uh, identification system shall be implemented to distinguish organic and non-organic crops. Um, example, color variety and pr products. 4.4, the operator shall design and implement a risk management plan to prevent GE contamination, which may include strategies such as physical barriers, barriers, border rows, delayed planting, testing of seeds, isolating distances, and equipment and storage sanitation pro protocols. Um, 4.45, records shall be maintained for at least five years beyond the creation. And 4.46, if pest and disease control substances that are not on li are listed on a permitted substance use li uh, list are used under any mandatory government program, the operator shall monitor and document their use. In the event of emergency pest or disease treatment, Canadian operators are required to notify their certifying body immediately of any change that may affect organic product certification. With the organic system plan, it is to be uh, updated annually. So that'll be uh, uh, provided by your certifying body. Um, uh, ProCert, we sent all ours out in January with a deadline of uh, March 31st for the extension applications to be received into our office. Uh, initial applicants must be um, submitted sooner than better. Uh, the two uh, dates to remember for initial applicants is having your application in 15 months prior to marketing an organic crop and 12 months prior to harvesting an organic crop. So um, preferably we'd love to, uh, like to see these into the offices by the um, end of May, latest end of June. So you don't have to worry about those uh, deadlines for the next year. So certification programs, uh, Canada or at organic regime and equivalency arrangements. Um, uh, uh, document which programs you want through the getting certified to core uh, Canada organic regime there. You automatically get equivalency to uh, ship your product into the US and to um, Europe. Uh, with the US there's a, a critical variance or two that you have to meet but uh, on the green side there won't be any issues there. Uh, scope of the operation. Uh, identifying what, uh, if you're doing crops, livestock, that type of thing. Um, identifying your buffer zones and boundaries for your organic fields. Uh, buffers can consist of, we can, you can do harvest your buffers separately, uh, trees, people like to use uh, grass strips, things like that to, to separate organic from conventional land. The buffer is going to be 28 um, feet or eight meters. Uh, next section would be on records to keep uh, seeds, seedling and treatment. Uh, if you're buying organic seed, we need that seed supply organic certificate. We need, um, uh, if it go, you send it somewhere to get cleaned, get a plant sanitation affidavit. Um, Non-treated st statements for non-organic seed if you complete a seed, seed search. Um, if not able to source any organic seed, you can go buy conventional seed and providing that you provide a, um, a cer or search for that organic seed, roughly a minimum of three, three contacts there. And non-GMO statements uh, for, for applicable seed. And uh, so in there, in the organic system plan, you have to go through your crop management practice such as crop rotation, um, acceptable uh, rotations are gonna include some soil building, deep rooted crops, um, uh, applying manure, anything like that. We don't uh, have the quick fixes that the conventional side does. So 
we got to control our weeds, disease, and pests through uh, proper uh, crop rotation and uh, soil nutrition. Field history. Uh, before you can uh, harvest the crop as organic, you must provide documentation that the land has been 36 months prohibited substance free. This can be done for, so if you have some hay land, you're looking at get it into organic here this year. Um, you could have, come have us pre-inspected here in 2020, um, as long as it uh, hasn't been anything applied in the last uh, three years, could have that organic in 2021. Do that by providing it in a prior land use affidavit um, when you're renting from people or uh, leasing land, so that could be added on later as well. Uh, your application will disclose how that land's been handled the past three years. And it'll include uh, what inputs, fertilizers, pesticides that you have used on those fields, uh, the last date of uh, prohibitive substance use. Um, other thing to be aware of parallel production, making sure crops are visually distinguishable as you transition from organic or conventional into organic, making sure that uh, uh, you can tell the difference between them. So that's saying you could have green peas on your organic and yellow peas on your conventional. Um, or uh, what would be one that wouldn't be permitted? Something like uh, a forage oat and uh, um, would be with a, a milling oat. If you grew both of those, they're not visually distinguishable. So therefore all your production that year on oats would be downgraded to non-organic. Um, in this, we also do to submit your field numbers, uh, farm maps, uh, field maps, so, so county maps, um, uh, yard maps showing the layout of the operation. I find that really handy as an inspector showing up to the place, making sure I'm in the right yard, seeing where all the bins and the, the layout of the, uh, the yard is. Other things required is the uh, chronological log, so this is where we document buffer handlings, um, crop monitoring activities, building and equipment sanitations, input use uh, on, on the sanitations. You know, every time we move fields, should be clean out our equipment so we're not transporting weeds across. Uh, even more so important if you're moving from conventional organic and um, documenting that you've cleaned out uh, your equipment especially if you're using some uh, seed treatments that weren't permitted and, and stuff like that. Other things we can put in there is uh, some of the inputs that you used uh, can be documented in your log. Uh, grain storage, so bins need to be visually, visibly numbered and we like to see individual bin records for uh, each bin. So we can document all the product that goes in and out there and uh, there'll be lot numbers uh, assigned to each um, each bit in there, showing where it came from, uh, when it was harvested, when it was put in there, when it was shipped, so we can uh, see full traceability from from harvest to uh, leaving the operation. So some of the production records here: uh, equipment cleanout records, maintain those, buffer management records. I mentioned those can be documented in the log or um, on a separate piece of paper. Uh, if you sell your, uh, sell the, do bales and stuff, so we'd like to see how you documented your sales of that. Um, on the green side, if you harvest it separately, where was it stored? Um, making sure that it was kept separate from your organic stuff. Uh, bin records, we talked about that, harvest records. Uh, and then there's uh, a lot number. So each uh, certifying body probably will uh, recommend uh, a style uh, lot numbering system for you. Um, marketing and sales records. So we need to uh, have all those. It's one of the things we'll be come out checking at the inspection, um, doing mass balance audits, uh, verifying your, the amount you produced, the amount you sold, and making sure that uh, there was no uh, conventional or anything blended in. Um, at the same time, we'll look at the confirm what you should have been harvesting there through your uh, through our yield estimates. Um, green receipts, they're important to keep there. 
uh, transportation sanitation affidavits. So when somebody comes, uh, picks up the grain, you have to complete uh, an affidavit verifying that the trailer was um, cleaned out properly prior to uh, shipping organic grain. You have to sign off on it, get a trucker sign off on it and, and keep those records to show your inspector. Um, there's also a verification of organic sales, which are VOSs or transaction certificates um, for tracing uh, sales of product. Um, but with that, that brings us to, gives us about 10 more minutes here to answer questions and uh, leave, it, leave it off there. Thank you. All right. Uh, I see we do have a couple of questions. Um, I think any of you three can answer them. I got this one right after right after Cody started. Um, wondering if the requirements for certification are the same across the provinces. Um, so, what are what is there differences across Canada for your? Uh, yeah, I can I can answer that one. Um, so in Canada, we're under the uh, core, so Canada organic regime, um, it, for shipping outside of province, or it has to be certified to core and all the provinces um, are certified to the same, uh, same program there. Uh, some of the provincial provinces have adopted the federal regulations and they're required to follow the um, course, core regulations there as well. So it is a coast to coast program. All right, uh, another question. Heard, heard of farmers selling grain organic who are not certified. Um, are there fines or penalties for that sort of stuff? I can answer that one. Uh, okay. Strictly like, fines or penalties coming from uh, from a regulatory body no uh, but there may be some penalties based on uh, lying to consumers and those ones would come directly from CFIA uh, but that's as far as I know unless Cody or March know something else I've heard that they are setting up a like a kind of a schedule for penalties. I don't know if that's become official yet or if that's waiting for the update of the uh, new regulations and then it'll be in there. Awesome. So, all right, uh, another question. Can you include a roadside ditch in the organic buffer zone if you've applied for no spray over three years? So this is Marg, I'll take my turn. Um, yes, you can, as long as you inform the county that you are certifying your land as organic, because then it will be up to you and your responsibility to maintain those ditches and ensure that you have your signage up saying that you're on a no spray zone so that it doesn't accidentally get sprayed. And just to complement a little bit on that, your buffer zone, if it's a ditch, it doesn't have to go into transition for three years. Uh, as long as during the organic crop year is not spray and it does not present a risk for contamination, it's good to go. All right. And I think Marianne wants to do, Marianne's going to quickly uh, just show us where you can get information about uh, other certifying bodies. So we'll do that real quick and then we'll answer a few more questions and call it good. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. So my name is Marianne Cron and I'm the admin assistant for Peace Contribution for the Association. 
Um, just something I wanted to add to uh, what we've seen today. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Mm. Not what I want. Oops. Is paused. Sorry, guys. Uh, oh, there. There you go. Uh, can you see my screen here? Uh, no, try again. Okay. Share screen. Oh, what does it do? It doesn't do it. Uh, mm, two screen implementing. Okay, um, it's not what I wanted. Share. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. Now? There you go. That looks like it's coming. I want to go, go on top there. <laughs> <laughs> mm. There. Certifying bodies, and I want to max out my screen. Ugh. Okay, how do I? There you go. So what I wanted to show you guys is, so like Joanna mentioned in the beginning, so today we have ProCert, OCIA, and EcoCert, and those are the ones who answered to our invitation to come to a live workshop that was planned in Heinz Creek. So we invited everyone who cover the um, Alberta. And I just wanted to uh, show you guys a resource. So it's from the Organic Alberta website. And, um, so they have a whole lot of information. Um, so I'm just going to show you the one uh, resource here. I got it from uh, Grow Organic and getting started and transitioning into organics. Um, so there is information about get to know the market, uh, whether you are interested in vegetable, field crop, beef production. And here on the left, um, I wanted to show you um, the certifying bodies in Alberta. So as you can see, there are, there are um, quite a few of them here. And um, also the one thing I wanted to mention is, uh, so choosing a um, certifying body is really an important step of uh, um, becoming organic. And they have a few questions here that I think uh, are really helpful. This one, how to choose a certification body. Here are some questions. So you can ask the agency, do you certify other farms or operations of my type? The agency should be familiar with your type of production, dairy, vegetables, sheep, grapes. Do you certify other farms in my region? The cost of certification typically is shared between many producers in the region. It makes sense to share expenses for the inspector's mileage, food and lodging with other area farmers rather than having to carry the financial burden of the cost on your own. How do you charge for organic certification services? How quickly can you inspect and certify my farm once I have submitted my application? And then also talk to neighbor farmers so, uh, uh, who are organic. So yeah, just, uh, just a resource here. So um, uh, yeah, you can uh, different contact if uh, you're looking for um, a certifier. And uh, oh, yeah, the mention, also what I wanted to mention, so next week, Organic Alberta will be with us uh, speaking. So they will talk to us about their resources. So that's next Friday at noon. And also uh, we'll have a presentation on inspection, which will be uh, done by uh, Dave Thompson. And Dave Thompson is an inspector, so he is, um, uh, contracted, I guess, by certifying bodies to uh, do the, the um, inspection. So that's next week, Friday at noon. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it. So awesome. Thanks, Marianne. I see we've got some more questions. Um, Cody, if you want to answer the one, uh, somebody's looking into regenerative grazing operations. 
if they were to plant non-organic grass seed this spring, does that mean they will have to wait 36 months to apply to be organic? No, as long as that grass seed's not treated with a prohibited substance, um, it'd be fine. Okay. So uh, there, just, yeah. No, sorry, if you want to have anything else to no, add No, that's good. Okay. Uh, there's another question for Cody. Uh, sorry if you went over this. I was pulled away from the computer. Does ProCert encourage 100% transition to organic production? If so, what's the time frame on that? Yeah, there's really no uh, set time frame specific, but what we want to see is an operation progress um, over time, uh, moving it you know, more towards organic. Um, the only time where we make issues of it when somebody's you know has one field that they have organic and they have no incentive at all of moving any of the other operation in um it, you know as long as we're seeing some progress every year to seeing more of that operation move towards organic that that would be acceptable another question on water if water from a nearby conventional field flows through an organic field during the spring runoff or large rain events is that a problem for certification i i can take that one perfect uh, I will answer with <laughs> with a never failing it depends so if if it if it's a significant amount and you see like real uh, like there is potential for contamination that's for sure uh, but i I wouldn't worry too much of it. Uh, unless you saw like for example if your neighbor the conventional neighbor that we are talking about was just seeding and he was just putting you know fertilizer and you have like a big stream going through your field then you probably want to mark down what portion of the field was affected by it uh but if it's just natural uh most likely there is not going to be a higher risk of contamination of your organic field, I will put down as an observation. Uh, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. In a worst case scenario, what would happen, and that we've seen before, is that if there is a contamination, uh, that specific portion of the field that was affected is um, is measured, and it's and it goes into transition for 36 months. But again, the only time that I saw that was in, in, in a field of a farmer that have a, a spill of the oil, of the oil site, of the oil lease that was in there, uh, where it was clearly visible that there was a problem and we even took samples and make sure that, to confirm that the contamination was present before we move on to designate that area as a transitional land. Can I just add on a bit too, Jaime, is the important thing is to is let your certifier know if you think it's uh, anything that could be um, affecting your crop. All right. Um, I do have one question that got sent in to us before the uh, before our webinar here. Uh, somebody was wondering what fertilizers get registered as organic and um, what they can use to what uh, producers can use as organic fertilizer. I can answer this one. Um, on uh, in Canada, some of the certifying bodies do have input approval programs, so you can check out. Uh, I know ProCert and both EcoCert have 
uh, input approval programs where you can go onto our website and and uh, find what inputs are or fertilizers are approved for use. Um, there's also you can get products approved by checking out the uh, permitted substance list, uh, seeing what ingredients are in that fertilizer, and submit a complete list of ingredients to your certifying body to review that specific product. Um, this we can uh, be plan on using uh, some type of inoculant, uh, say like a nodulator XL or something like that, uh, liquids, send it into us, um, and we'll look at the ingredients of it and send you back a letter letting you know that that uh, that is approved for use and that's the same as uh, as the fertilizers there perfect and it's important to remember too this is mark sorry that that in the regulations it does stip stipulate that every certifier is responsible for reviewing any inputs so i know that with oci we use omri o-m-r-i .ca or .com and then go on to Canada and we will use anything that's been approved for Canada on their list. So, but other than that, then we would review if, um, if it's something that you do want to use on your operation. Awesome. Um, another question, is it acceptable to wash equipment in the buffer zone when moving from conventional to organic fields? This is Jaime here. So it means you move your conventional equipment and before it gets into the organic field, it's washed in the buffer. That's how I understand it. So uh, yeah. um, I, I, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't say that's the best scenario, but it's, but it's not uh, something that could uh, compromise the operation. Keep in mind that the buffer, the buffer strip is the main the main the main use for it is to guard your organic crop against uh, drift from conventional sprays. So it's like a safe zone where um, anything that is non-compliant that could uh, affect your your certification it's 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 guarded and it's retained. I guess depending on what type of washing you want to do but uh, if you are washing right in the buffer and if you are just flushing grain probably wouldn't be a big deal but if you are like like blowing stuff it may actually blow into your organic crop so I wouldn't I, I would think that that may be a potential source of contamination so that was a long answer the short answer is probably avoid it and try to do it elsewhere. All right, doesn't look like we have too many, any more questions. So uh, thank you, uh, Jaime, Mark, and Cody for uh, calling in and presenting to us. Um, for the, all of you on the call, thank you for tuning in and we will uh, send out the recording of this webinar here in the next week or so and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next next webinar on Friday. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful week.